I no, I will not. Don't worry. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Welcome. Ah, take a take a nice deep breath. Let go of everything. If you've got cell phones or anything like that, turn them off. Put them away. God will not be texting us or Snapchatting during the service. But we're going to be singing together. And so with that, let us begin. <laughs> is this Shabbat, this wonderful evening together, a time in which we get to first breathe, knowing that the week has passed, that for the next 25 hours, we don't have to worry about anything, or we should try not to worry about anything. <clears throat> we should let go of everyday cares and worries and the to-do lists and all the stuff that we do during the rest of the week because God gives us this wonderful day of Shabbat, this day of rest. So I encourage you to, maybe if it's not all 25 hours, maybe if it's just an hour that you get to take for yourself, not including this one, this one's a given, but I want you to think about you know, later on, finding that time for yourself because that is truly the greatest gift of all, is a gift that we can give to ourselves. So also we think about the joy of this day, um, a day in which you know maybe there's birthdays that have been celebrated during the past week. Happy birthday, Lori. 18th anniversaries, Steve and Cheryl, the two of you, you know, The two of you, uh, you know, <laughs> Susan, why did I do that again? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I did that again. I it is stuck. I should just look down at my notes better on. <laughs> Steve and Susan, and luckily I didn't do it 18 years ago when you <laughs> stood under the chuppah together as my second wedding. Oh my God, I'm just never going to live that one down. <laughs> And it's on the internet for everybody to see. <sighs> but 18 years ago, how awesome. Chai. And celebrating tonight, 23 years, Mitch and Kathy, mazel tov to you. Yay! <laughs> I was not there when you got married. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but thank you so much for honoring us with blessings and, you know, so Mitch and Kathy Cohen, I'm a Cohen, there's lots of, there, there, we've got Joyce Cohen here who's going to be speaking later on, 
And then, of course, we have another Cohen family. No relations. No relations at all, but maybe somewhere back at the time of the tabernacle. Who knows? Because Dylan, we get to celebrate you becoming bar mitzvah on this Shabbat. Yay. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Eyes totally lit up. <clears throat> so how wonderful that we get to celebrate this uh, on this Shabbat with you becoming bar mitzvah. So Dylan, we need you to come up with your parents, with Darren and Amy and your sister Caitlin, to come light our Shabbat candles. We're all going to turn to page two in our prayer books for the lighting of our candles. All right, so Dylan, I'm going to be your flame. There you go. Will you move my hand? There you go. Hold my hand. You ready? Okay, let's light the candles together. There you go. Let's go over to this one. Perfect. All right, blow it up. Perfect. Nice. nice job. As we join together with the cantor. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech, ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-ha-
Malachim Lishalom, Malachi Hashalom, Malachi Elion. Mihi Melech, Malachi Hamlachim, Hakadosh, Baruchu. Baruchu Lishalom, Malachi Hashalom, Malachi As we turn now to page 26, Chatzi Kaddish. Yit Gadal ve Yit Kadash me Rabba. Amen. Dal Maldi Brahmi Rutevi Amlith Mahute. Mecha ye kono yo mehon. Ukaye de Kobet Yisrael. Bagala Bagala. Uviz Mahan Kari. Amen. Yeh <laughs> Amen. As we rise now for Baruch Hu, page 28. <laughs> Adonai Hamevora Page 31 at the top together. Praise to you, Adonai, our God, from whom the evening flows. Your wisdom sets the way on which time and season glide. Your breath guides the sail of the stars, creator of the tide of time and light. You guide the current of day into night. As heaven spans to infinity, you set its course for eternity. Praise to you, Adonai, our God, from whom the evening flows. Baruch Ata Adonai Hama'ariv Aravim. As we continue on page 32. Ahava Tolam Beit Yisrael Amcha Havtam Torah and mitzvot, chukim and mishpatim, otanu limad etam. Al kein Adonai Eloheinu, bishopenu uvekumenu, nasiach 
Hasir mi menul holamim, baruchat Adonai, ohiv amo Yisrael. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Shema Yisrael. Continue on page 36, chanting Ve'ahavta. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha Bechol Evacha ubechol Nafshecha Ubechol Meodecha Ve'ahiru Hadibarim Ha'ele Asher Anochim Et Savecha Uchtavtam <laughs> I'm <laughs> As we turn to page 39, in the middle together, in a world torn by violence and pain, a world far from wholeness and peace, give us the courage to say Adonai, there is one God in heaven and earth. The high heavens declare your glory. May earth reveal your justice and love. From bondage in Egypt, we were delivered. At Sinai, we bound ourselves to your way. Inspired by prophets and instructed by sages, time and again, we overcame oppressive forces. Though our failings are many and our faults are great, it has been our glory to bear witness to our God keeping alive in dark ages your vision of a world redeemed. Let us continue to work for the day when the nations will be one and at peace. Then shall we rejoice as Israel did, singing on the shores of the sea. Mi Hamocha, page 40. 
Continue on page 42, Hashkivenu. 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 Try that with me. Hashkivenu. Ashkivenu Adonai Eloheinu L'shalom L'shalom Ashkivenu Ashkivenu Adonai Eloheinu Shalom. We have a day to Eloheinu l'shalom, l'shalom. Hashkivenu, hashkivenu, Adonai, Eloheinu l'shalom. Baruch atah Adonai hapore sukat shalom aleinu. Ve'akol amo Yisrael ve'al Yerushalayim. Blessed are you, Adonai, guardian of Israel, whose shelter of peace is spread over us, all your people Israel, and over Jerusalem. As we give thanks and are we guardians of Shabbat v'shamru, page 44. V'shamru Oh, 
Adonai Svatai Tivta Adonai Svatai Tivta Ufi Yagid Tehilatecha Ufi Yagid Tehilatecha Blessed are you, Adonai, the holy God. 
Please be seated. Ever present one, page 57. May we, your people Israel, be worthy in our deeds and our prayer. Wherever we live, wherever we seek you, in this land, in Zion restored, in all lands, you are our God, whom alone we serve in reverence. Baruch Ata Aronai, Sheotcha Levadcha Beyira Naavod. God of goodness, we give thanks for the gift of life, wonder beyond words, for the awareness of soul, our light within, for the world around us so filled with beauty, for the riches of the earth which day by day sustains us. For all these and more, we offer thanks. Baruch Ata Aronai. Hatov Shimcha Ocha Na'en Hodot. On this weekend of Veterans Day, I'd like to invite to please stand, if you are able, all of those who have served or are serving in our armed forces in the United States, and yes, also in Israel as well, but especially within our United States. We are so grateful to each and every one of you, to the gifts that you have given to us. Each of you took a vow, took an oath to protect this country, to be there to fight for freedom, to stand for freedom. Each of you have been a blessing and are a blessing. Where you stand, others were not able to. Others might have chosen not to. But you, you stepped forward and you said, He nani, here I am. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your dedication. Most importantly of all, thank you for your blessings. God of compassion, God of dignity and strength, watch over each of you and every veteran of the United States. In recognition of their loyal service to our nation, bless each of them with wholeness and love. Shelter them, heal their wounds, comfort their hearts, grant them peace. God of justice and truth, rock of our lives, bless all of our veterans. These men and women, of courage and valor, with a deep and abiding understanding of our profound gratitude, protect them and their families from loneliness and want. Grant them lives of joy and bounty. May their dedication and honor be remembered as a blessing from generation to generation. Blessed are you, protector and redeemer, our shield and our stronghold. And let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you for your service. And with this, we join together with a prayer of peace that we each should know peace and that our world should know peace. As we turn to page 60, Shalom Rav. Shalom Rahab, Israel, Amatha, Tassim, Leulam. Shalom Rahab, Israel, Amatha, Tassim, Leulam. Kiatahum, Behadon, the Kulha Shalom. Shalom 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 
take these moments and offer a mishaberach for prayer of healing for all of those who are in need of healing of mind, of body, and of spirit. Mishaberach avotenu v'imotenu Abraham Yitzchak v'yakov, Sarah Rivka Rachel v'alea, hu yivarech et ha'cholim. I invite you as I face in your direction if there are names of those who you would like to share at this moment for mishaberach, please call them out from your seats at this time. Nick Brady, Murray Reimold. May the Blessed Holy One be filled with compassion for their health to be restored and their strength to be revived. May God swiftly send them a complete renewal of body and spirit. And let us say, Amen. Amen. of strength who blessed in the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say Bless those in need of healing with refuah shlema, the renewal of body, the renewal of spirit, and let us say, Amen. We continue now with silent meditation.
of my heart be acceptable unto you Adonai you the rat son him Adonai, Suri, Vego Ali. For Veterans Day, I thought how much more appropriate it is than rather my trying to talk about Veterans Day, but rather to ask a veteran to speak and to share her story. And so I am truly grateful that Joyce Keller Cohen agreed to come and to share her story with us of service and the honor. So Joyce, thank you so very much, not only for your service, but also for the gratitude that we have as your congregation to have this opportunity to hear from you on this wonderful Shabbat. No. So she served in the United States Navy in the JAG Corps. <laughs> and then I'll let you tell the rest of the story of that one. <laughs> so come. <laughs> You're welcome. So please come. Thank you very much. Go ahead. You know, at the outset, I, I'd like to thank all the people who came to hear me speak because some people came up and said, you know, Joyce, I came specifically to hear you and I really appreciate that. that that's very heartening. But it's not just my story, it's really the story of all the veterans who have served in the military and particularly those who have been serving recently when the stakes are that much higher because so many of them have returned home both physically and emotionally maimed. And I think that, I will say this at the outset, that I don't think this country respects what these young men and women have done. And I think that we have to remember to honor them every day, because I know that I do. In any case, you know, I have to say it's a very interesting thing and very um, prescient that I am speaking about the military because I am going to be 60 years old and I am finally going to collect my military retirement pay. <laughs> I just put in my application to get it and for so many years I was serving time in the military and you know I was getting paid for my drills and all that but there were times I wasn't getting paid and I never saw a paycheck every month. So when I turn 60 in July I expect to see that check in the mail. Well, I, I just have to say that, you know, it's a very unusual thing, particularly in my family, for somebody to go into the military. Now, my father was a CB, and my uncle was a Marine, and it was through my uncle who met my father, who, met my, who introduced him to my mother, that I'm standing here. But after my father got out of the military, he never, ever mentioned his military service. Never. You know, I knew that he had been a CB, but that was it. And then you have somebody like me, who was born in Brooklyn, in Bensonhurst. And I'm not talking about the Jewish section. I'm talking about the section, I don't know if any of you remember the movie Saturday Night um, Fever, 
Well, I grew up there, and I was dancing in those clubs. So you're talking about somebody who wasn't exactly what you would call a candidate for the United States military. But what happened is that um, rather than becoming a legal secretary, which most of my friends were doing at the time, and again, this was in the late 70s, um, early 80s, I was in a combined BAJD program, and I, got, I was getting out of law school, and I thought to myself, now what am I going to do? And at the time, I was very lucky. I was dating a nice Jewish boy. Not only was he a nice Jewish boy, his father owned property. He owned an apartment building in Brooklyn. And you know, that would have been a good deal. But the reason I think I joined the military is because of mothballs. And I say this because he was a lovely guy. But you know, if you lived in Brooklyn, and any of you who lived back east know this, you had to put mothballs in your closet in the winter so that you didn't get you know, the little moth things in your clothes. Well, this guy, every time I opened up his closet, I smelled the mothballs. And I said, I'll, be a, I'll smell like a mothball, my children will smell like a mothball, and from eternity, we'll all smell like mothballs. And I just said to my mother, you know, I can't do this. She said, are you sure? And I said, yeah. So it turned out that the military um, recruiter came to my law school. And originally, you know, I thought this would be fun. I'll go into the Marines. But you know, you really have to be in physical shape. And that was not my thing. So the Marine guy told me, go to the Navy. So I went to the Navy. And who was my military handler? A huge Afro-American guy. He must have been six foot five, and he was a pilot. Now, you have to understand, where I grew up in Brooklyn, it was very, I, I would say it was relatively segregated, and nobody was 6'5", because you had the very little Jews and the very little Italians, and these people were short. I mean, 5'6 was considered, you know, pretty good. Well, the guy's name was Jimmy Johnson, and I always remember this, because he was just, you know, we called them fly boys, and he was just perfect. He was just such a naval specimen. And he said, Joyce, I'll go meet your family, and I'll tell them it's fine for you to go into the military. So Jimmy Johnson drives in a military car, and he goes to a park in Bensonhurst, where my parents are sitting and my aged Uncle Ted. Uncle Ted was about 80 years old at the time, and Jimmy Johnson gets out of the car. And you know, you have to understand what Brooklyn was like. Everybody sat in the park, and they sat on these beach chairs with the slats, and they're all sitting there doing whatever, and this huge Afro-American guy comes up with a military uniform. Everybody stops dead. And he goes and said, you know, Mrs. Meisner, because that was my maiden name, I'm very happy to meet you, and I think Joyce will do very well in the Navy JAG Corps. And my Uncle Ted, who was, you know, starting to lose it at that time, yells out in Yiddish, was is das? He, he couldn't believe this. He said, what is this? What is this girl doing? But in any case, I just said, you know what? I'm doing it. And three days before I graduated law school, at 22, I was very young, I signed up. But it shows you how ignorant I was. Because normally, when you sign up for the military and you take your oath of officership, you wear a suit. I was so oblivious, I went straight from my last law school class in a Birkenstock sandal. Um, I was wearing overalls, denim overalls, and a, an embroidered like peace shirt. And there's a picture of me, which I have in my office today, raising my right hand with Jimmy Johnson, and I'm dressed like that. And I thought to myself, you know what, if that doesn't show you there's room in the organization for everybody. <laughs> you know, I, I just think about it, and I laugh, because I think, you know, how could this be? Well, anyway, what I did is I joined, and I thought, you know, you could do anything for four years. And I knew that I could always come back but I would get to see a part of the world that I would never see otherwise. Because if you don't do it at a certain time in your life, you never do it. And then you're stuck in a pattern. And then you hate your kids, and you want to throw them out the window. And you don't want, I don't want to do that. You know, I just thought I was going to end up in an apartment building in Brooklyn smelling like mothballs, and that wasn't going to cut it. So I actually went to officer candidate school in Newport, Rhode Island in 1981. They called it knife and fork school. That's where they put all the doctors, the lawyers, the dentists, the civil engineer corps, and um, the bug guys. That was the medical service corps. That's the first time I met an entomologist. I didn't even know what that was, but I remember I met my first one. And the reason we went there is because they had to teach us how to wear a uniform, 
had a salute, had a march, because we looked like a bunch of idiots. And they didn't want us to embarrass the Navy. See, when you go into a staff corps, you're coming from a very different position than if you go in on active duty in the line community. So they didn't want us to embarrass the United States Navy. So they sent us to school. And I met some really, really wonderful people. And I spent six weeks there. And I knew I was different from everybody else because all the women, you know, you have to get your uniforms fitted and there's different ensembles. And I was the only one who shopped the sale rack. <laughs> you know, they, they actually did have a sale rack. And I did it. And, you know, people were going, are you sure you want to do that? And I go, oh, yes, I do. So I knew that there was a, a major difference. The other thing is there was not a Jew in my, OS, uh, my officer class. I thought, oh my God. And you know, they looked at me as strangely as I looked at them. Because when I grew up in Brooklyn, you were either Jewish or Catholic. There was nothing else. And I get there and I look at these people from Texas, from Iowa. I thought, who are these freaks? And they were <laughs> Baptists. Methodists, I thought, oh my God. You know, I had never met one. And I don't think they had ever met a Jew. And the thought of a Jew being in the military and a woman, and at the time, you know, I must admit, I was rather thin. I was a very svelte young officer. And you had to be, because otherwise you would be in big trouble, as I will tell you shortly. So then I went to Washington. And when I found out that I had passed the bar, um, my mother called Wash Washington and told them that, you know, I had passed the bar so now I could continue my military training. And the guy called my mother ma'am. Now, in Brooklyn, you never called somebody ma'am. That was insulting because it meant you were old. My mother opened up a mouth on him. <laughs> she said, what are you doing? You're calling me ma'am. What's wrong with you? Are you sick? You know, and I said, mom, please don't do this. You're embarrassing me. She said, I didn't mean to be rude. I said, you were very rude, and this guy will remember me forever. And he was my detailer, which means he was the one who decided where I was going to go. Fortunately, he sent me to um, San Diego, California. But I will tell you, before we had to go to um, our final duty station, and mine was uh, San Diego, thank God, we had to go to Officer Justice School, Naval Justice School. Um, and that was in Newport, Rhode Island, in the middle of the winter. And I always remember that because what they did is they taught us how to try military cases. And when you look at it, it's not that different than trying a case in a regular arena. It's almost like, but you use the federal rules. So I always thought like I was in the federal government except that I wore a uniform. And when I had to learn how to, to try a military case, I said, okay, they'll teach me how to do it. Well, as it turned out, there was one other Jewish person in my Justice School class, and I remember her because her name was Faith Liebman. Now, I think between her and myself, we were two of the best examples of young Jewish women. The problem with Faith is that Faith was chubby. All right, I'm chubby now, and I can't get a thigh into my uniform. <laughs> but Faith was young, and she was chubby then. And at the time, we had to wear these black uniforms that are unforgiving. That's how the naval uniforms are. You're fat, you're dead. And Faith was a little chubby, I remember that. And she was a little sloppy. You know, you had to be very neat. So Faith and I were learning how to try cases. I was the prosecutor, and I think Faith was a witness. There was one military person. Um, they had to get people to sit on the juries, or what we call members. And there was one guy who was looking at Faith and I very intently. And he's looking at us and looking at us. And I'm thinking he's looking at me because he's thinking I'm doing a really great job, you know, cross-examining Faith, who looked like a slob. But anyway, he's looking at me. And I thought, OK. Well, anyway, we do our little case. And I don't know what happened. I don't know. I think the government won. So I was lucky because I was the prosecutor. And then I went to pick up these blue books that they had given all of the military members or jury members uh, I guess, you know, they wrote notes, they wrote questions, and I picked up a book where he was sitting. I opened up the book. The only thing in that book was swastikas. And I always remember that because I thought to myself, boy, the J is on my forehead. And I never forgot that. Now, the question is, what do you do about it when you discover it? Do you make a big deal? I remember calling my mother and I said, Ma, I made a big mistake. And she said, shut up about it. 
And I said, you know what? I am going to shut up because I knew I had to be a warrior princess. I knew I was going on, and if I said something, it would be held against me for the rest of my life. And I wanted to try cases, and I did not want to be seen as a complainer or a whiner in the military. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm just saying the one thing that I have learned over the years is that sometimes you just have to suck it up and be a warrior princess. And I always remembered that. I never forgot it. And I never forgot who I was. But seeing those swastikas reminded me that I was out of New York and that I was moving into a very new territory. So what happens? They then put me on a ship because you had to do two weeks on a ship so that you knew exactly what it was like. And they put me on a small frigate going out of San Francisco. Well, I'd never been on a ship before. And a frigate rocks and rolls. So I spent two weeks wearing a flak jacket with saltine crackers in my pocket so I didn't barf on somebody over the side. Because I thought the worst thing that could happen to me is if I threw up on somebody, I would never live it down. And I also tried Navy coffee for the first time. There's nothing like doing a watch in the middle of the night, watching somebody shoot a sextant and watching the stars and drinking that Navy coffee because it was black. You could never put cream in it, otherwise you were a wimp. And it literally grew hair on your chest. <laughs> and to this day, I drink it like that. The other thing is I don't wash my coffee cup. It, it's, it's a Navy tradition. You don't wash your coffee cup. I don't want to tell you that nobody will ever steal my cup. And, you know, I'm almost 60 years old, and it's not happening. <laughs> so anyway, I arrived in San Diego, California, and I noticed one other thing. When I would call my mother, she would only talk about the dog. And I said, Mom, you know, I'm having a really hard time in San Diego. I'm, I have to adjust to many things. I said, why don't you ask about me? She said, because the dog didn't leave me. <laughs> and I always remember that. I mean, she never, ever forgave me for that. But... You know, when I got to um, San Diego, I, I, it was unbelievable. First of all, I couldn't drive. I had just learned how to drive. And people thought that I was developmentally disabled because I could barely, you know, park. I, I, had, I had a little Honda Civic. I could not drive it. I was the worst driver in the world. And people just laughed at me all the time. But I didn't care. Look, you know, I had to get somewhere. And I, you know, when I got to the, the, the Nilso, I saw palm trees. And I thought, what are those things? They looked so strange to me. And everybody just seemed so strange. And then the military personnel seemed strange. Because, you know, you had all these guys that were not Jewish. The women weren't Jewish. They weren't Jewish. And everybody was tall. They were tall. Now, my best friend, Ellen Coldaway, Ellen McGrath Coldaway, Commander Coldaway, who was, you know, my BFF, whatever you say, Ellen is almost six feet tall. Okay, and she can rock a military cape, a dress uniform, and a tiara like nobody. <laughs> you know, and they looked more like Ellen than they looked like me. So I get there, and first of all, nobody could understand me. The court reporters, because I was trying cases at the time, told me to take elocution lessons. I was actually told that, and basically, you know what I told them, because you see how I sound now. <laughs> but this is, um, you know, it was a very, very interesting experience. The other thing, and I learned a very important lesson, and I will tell you that, is that I learned that the best and brightest are not the best and brightest. It's not the ones that always go to Harvard and Yale, because I used to think, you know, the better school you went to, the smarter you were, baloney. Because I met chiefs in the Navy and enlisted personnel who could fix anything, find anything, and do anything. And that was a big lesson for me, because I met people that were not, maybe you would say, educationally inclined, but they basically could run this country barehanded because of what they could do. And that was a big lesson. It really took me down a peg, and it taught me about maybe listening to people who were different than you, but who know a lot more than you. You know, you would think I would listen to the young lieutenants. I thought they were morons. I listened to those chiefs, those smart guys, and I learned how to get around. Plus, if I needed anything, they were the first ones who knew how to steal it. <laughs> but. Um, you know, the other thing that I, you know, want to say is people asked me, you know, was I sexually harassed? And I'll tell you, when I was a lot younger and thinner, I looked great in a uniform. But I perfected what you would call an attitude. And I remember one CO said to me, God, you know, you're cute, but man, what a mouth on you. And that was true. It was like a protective stench. I did not want them messing with me. 
And really, you had to be very careful because what I learned in the military is you don't go drinking in the officer club, you don't go drinking with the guys. If you want to rise in the ranks, you have to behave yourself because one misstep is going to screw your career. And I wanted to become the top to prove myself that I could do it, both you know, intellectually and physically. And you know what? It was a good lesson because I carried that lesson with me in life, particularly in my professional life. You behave yourself because if you don't behave yourself and you get sloppy, you're going to pay for it. And I saw a lot of women in the military, particularly those who like to get drunk and run around topless at the CEO's party. Not a good thing for promotion. I always remembered that. But I will tell you, I was very lucky. I got to try a capital murder case when I was 26 years old. And most people, even in a public defender's office, will never get to do that. And I got to do that. And I got to travel on ships. They would pod me on a ship. They'd put me in a little plane, and then they'd snap me on the deck. And I'd go back and forth, off the ship, on the ship. And it was wonderful. And there was one time they put me on a frigate. And these guys were out to sea for about six months. And I was the only woman. I had an armored guard. And out, I slept in the admiral's cabin, and that guy stayed outside all night with a gun. You know, it makes you feel like you're some property, you know? <laughs> it was good. Well, anyway, I had a marvelous four-year experience in the military. And I will also tell you, it was a different time. And that's why, in many ways, I was blessed. I was not on active duty during wartime. And that makes the biggest difference. Because today, if you were on active duty, you're not looking at a Cush duty station in San Diego. You're looking somewhere else. And you know they'll send a JAG to Afghanistan to advise on um, you know, international law as soon as they would anybody else. So it's a, it was a very different time. And the stakes were very different. But in any case, I decided after four and a half years that I was going to get out of the active duty phase, and I was going to go into the reserves. Because I didn't want to move around every four years, and I loved San Diego. So I took the California bar, and I stayed. But the one thing that I did, because I really liked the military life, is I went into the reserves. So I, I got out one month. The next month, I was in the reserves, which meant two weeks a year, if not more, one weekend a month. So for 18 and a half years, that's what I did. That was my life for 18 and a half years. And one weekend a month, that's how it was. You just got up and you did it. And you had to travel or you, you were local, whatever it was. But that's what I did. And I even had a unit in New York. Um, I was very lucky. Fort Hamilton, which was a base near where I grew up, I could take the city bus there from my original apartment in Brooklyn needed an executive officer to run their international law unit. Well, I was very, it was a very difficult time in my life. My mother was dying. I knew it. So I wrote to the Navy and said, listen, you give me this billet. I'll run your I-law unit, and I'll pay. I'll use my drill pay to fly out. So that's exactly what I did. One month, a year, one, month one weekend a month, I flew out to Brooklyn. I'd leave on a Friday morning, snowstorm, no snowstorm, getting stuck somewhere. I had to make it to that drill unit, and I did. But the funny thing is, here it was, I was back home after all these years, and my old neighbors were still living in their rent-controlled apartments. You know, people don't move in Brooklyn. They die in those apartments. So my neighbor, who lived next door to me, said, oh my god, you're a flight attendant. I said, not quite. <laughs> they just, it, they didn't get it. You know, they just didn't get it. But the other wonderful thing was, in that particular unit, all the guys were from Brooklyn. And they, didn't, they used to forget that I was flying in from California. So I was responsible to make all the lunch reservations, because they figured I knew all of the um, restaurants in Fort Hamilton, which I did. And you know, in Brooklyn, things don't change. So I was able to take care of them. And they used to forget that I came in from California every month. But it was a really good experience for me. And it, it showed me that you know you could travel and you could do many things. Now, I also did a lot of other things. I was in a unit where um, it was an activation unit, where if we ever had a war, we would be the ones to activate the reservists. And I, of course, I was part of the legal contingent, which meant that I had to decide whether the conscientious objectors who did not want to go to war had valid stories. As far as I was concerned, honey, you're on the bus. You're going. And sure enough, 
at, in what I was in that unit, right when I was ready to leave it, that's when the Gulf War came up and my unit got activated. And it just so happened that I would have been going, except for the fact that I had left the unit a month before. And that's when being in the reserves took a turn for me because I realized that the stakes were becoming higher and it just wasn't getting a drill paycheck. It wasn't going and doing legal work, writing briefs, doing all that other stuff, doing legal assistance, but there were real consequences and real people that were gonna be affected by my actions because somebody who was getting recalled needed a power of attorney and a will and I had to draft those wills and powers of attorneys because they might not be coming back or when they left, somebody had to take care of their property. And I remember specifically, because I was drilling with Commander Coldaway at the time, where I was providing legal services where I had to deal with somebody who needed a will and a power of attorney. And the guy, I think, was a Jewish guy, and he owned apartment buildings in LA. And he said to me, listen, I can't go. Who's gonna watch my apartment buildings? I said, I got news for you. You're going, and that's not an excuse. And it really hit me because it could have been me, it could have been my friends, it could have been anybody I know who had sustained a life outside of the military, was drilling, and now that person's life was affected by the war. And it, it changed my perspective. And it was a very, very, I, I think it was a watershed moment for me. The other thing at that time is I really decided I wanted to make captain. And for me, that was a big deal because I always thought if a Jewish girl from Brooklyn could make captain, there definitely was room in the organization. And that took a lot of work. I mean, that took traveling. That took um, physical. I, I, I had to be at the, the, the top of my physical form. And what that meant is I had to stay thin. I literally had to starve myself for three years so I could fit into a uniform. And when they took a picture of me, I looked thin. Do you know what that's like for a Jewish woman approaching middle age who loves to eat? <laughs> it was torture. It was absolute torture for me. But I did it, and I made captain at 40, which was very young. Well, after that, you know, my life changed. My first husband died under very tragic circumstances, and I decided I wanted to become a parent. So I punched out. Or as we say in the military, I was going to say pull the plug, but my husband hates when I say that word because it has other connotations. And at, I guess I must have been around 42. I had spent three years as a captain and I retired because I had adopted my daughter. So essentially I went from blowing up things, fighting fires, to play dates with a five and a half year old who couldn't speak English. And that was an interesting experience. But I will tell you this, the qualities that I learned in the military and the responsibility, self-sufficiency, and loyalty are attributes that I think have helped me in my life, no matter what has happened in my life. But I also think that they are qualities and attributes that are not being taught in other arenas today, and that our young people are suffering because they are not learning the self-sufficiency that they need to learn. So I really feel that it has been a blessing for me. I mean, there were good times and there were bad times, and I did not agree with all of the Navy's policies, you know, and I had to reconcile that. But I'll tell you, they taught me how to fire a gun, and, you know, it's nice to be a self-sufficient warrior princess. Even if I don't use it very often, I know how to do it. And I will tell you one other thing before I end. It's always good to have certain qualities. Ellen and I um, get together, and that was a very great gift, because sometimes you make friends in the military that you keep forever, and that's a real gift. And I have managed to keep many wonderful friends, but Ellen has been a great gift in my life. And so we had a barbecue at Ellen's house. And Ellen's husband's an engineer, and he thinks we're idiots because we, we don't know how to do anything, you know? We can't fix anything, we can't do anything. Well, we managed to blow up Ellen's grill. I don't know how two women can blow up a grill, but we did it, and it caught fire, and it was just, didn't bat an eyelash. We l remembered our Navy training, took the hose, put it out, then went back to eat. <laughs> and I always say, that's a good thing. Thank you.
Thank you, Reverend. Adele, just putting you on the list. You're on notice next. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and we're, we really hope to hear other stories too because it, it, thank you, Joyce, so very, very much um, for sharing your story. And it is, it's so important that we listen to our veterans and hear all, there, there are so many different perspectives and so we, we hope to hear more as well. At this time, I'd like to inv invite forward Jack Holmes, president of our congregation, as well as a veteran. Yes, you do. <laughs> you thought it was bad following me. <laughs> so come on forward to share some things that are going on. And we thank you also for your service, sir. Thank you. Yep, oh, you got it? Perfect. OK. Wow, Joyce, thanks. That was, that's an amazing story. I think we found our new official TBS storyteller. Yes. <laughs> and by the way, Joyce is appearing at the Irvine Improv next week. <laughs> <coughs> um, and, and we are proud of our, our veterans and service members. Uh, we enjoy liberty and freedom today because of the sacrifices of those people. So thank you everybody at TBS who's a veteran or an active service member. Oh, and by the way, there's one more birthday today. Today's the birthday of the Marines. Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah. What birthday is it, Larry? I just said that. What number? Yes, please. 242 years ago. Quite a, quite a history and tradition. All right. <clears throat> Mazel Tov Dylan on your bar mitzvah tomorrow. I can't wait to go to the service. I just know you're going to be fantastic. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Mazel Tov to your family as well. Um, tomorrow in Torah study, Alita Bryant's going to be discussing uh, Kai Sarah. Is that right? Are we going to talk about that really great real estate deal that Abraham made? I, I hope so. Yeah. Good. He made probably the best deal, uh, real estate deal ever in history. And if you want to hear about it, be there tomorrow. Um, let's see here. Oh, next Friday, we're hosting a, a multi, what's it, uh, multi congregational interfaith Serenity Shabbat. Oh. No, no, I'm mixing them up. I'm oh. sorry. Sorry, sorry. Next Friday, the 17th, is the Serenity Shabbat right. with Brad Winneberg as our guest speaker. And we're going to be discussing and increasing the awareness of addiction in the Jewish community. So it's a compelling story and a compelling issue for us. So you really should attend and, and listen in on that. It's Sunday the 19th that uh, Cantor Reinwald and Rabbi Cohen are going to be participating in the interfaith Thanksgiving service at the Anaheim United Methodist Church in Anaheim. That's on State College Boulevard, and it's going to be at 4 p.m. No food. No, no food. So, okay. Um, let's see, we're going to start our Hanukkah lighting soon, right, at the circle. That's going to be coming up soon. We'll give you the dates and times of who's going to be sponsoring each different one. We also have a brand new program that we're doing in January. It's going to be led by Rabbi and Todd Littman. We are going to be exploring the intersection of legal, spiritual, and faith issues regarding end-of-life care. This is something that applies to everybody here at some time or another in their life, so I think it would be worth your time to go and listen to what they have to say. Uh, at this time of the year, as the nights get longer and it gets cold outside and some people are alone, there are ways that we can strengthen our community and help those in need. Please donate to the Sadaka box for our Thanksgiving cards, donate jackets and warm clothing to our Adopt a Social Worker program, and help out the mitzvah meals where needed so people don't go hungry while we offer thanks for all the gifts that life has given to us. The details on those different programs are in your flyer for you to read tonight. And is Sarah here? Oh, hi, Sarah. Are we going to have the shop open? Okay, Sarah will open our shop at the, after the end of the service. I think that's about it. Sir, did I miss anything? I think no? you got it all. Okay, well, I, you make me follow that, and it's just a I think you got it all. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. We take uh, a moment now as we conclude our service. Aleinu page 282. I invite you to please rise. Alinu l'shabeach l'adon hakol L'atek l'an yotze b'reshit Sh'lo asanu k'yo yeharatzot V'lo samanu k'mishpikot adama Sh'lo sam chelkinu k'ahem V'goralinu k'chol 
המולם, ואנחנו קוראים ומשתחווים ומודים לפני מלך מלכי המלכים הקדוש ברוך הוא. ונאמר והיה אדוני למלך על כל הארץ ביום ההוא, ביום ההוא יהיה אדוני אחד ושמו, ושמו, ושמו אחד. We remain standing now as our thoughts turn to those who are no longer with us, yet truly their memories are a part of our lives and a part of our story, and we honor them now. We remember all of those whose yard sites occur on this Shabbat and during this coming week. Dorothy Altshuler, Eli Shezer, Jenny Post Cohen, Abe Danchus, Irene Ellis, Samuel Field, Louis Fine, Colonel Gerald Fink, Grace Frisch, Sharon Freed, Jerry M. Garfield, Bluma Glasser, Jesse Handler, Albert Hollander, David Jackman, Michelle Johnson, Helen Kaminsky, Sonia Kolofsky, Stephanie Lillian, Sheila Michaels, Robert O'Brien, Ernest Polin, Joseph Posner, Frida Reel, Lillian Rofsky, Claire Edith Rosenberg, Lauren Rusikoff, Meyer Schwartz, Joseph Shebro, Stephen Silberfarb, Ronald Slaughter, Melanie Solomon, Luba Wayne, Ruth Weinberg Lipset, Mary Williams, and Lillian Yargota. If there is anyone here who's in the period of mourning of Shiva, Shloshim, or Shana, who's observing a yard site of a loved one whose name I have not called, I invite you as I face in your direction to please share their names with us. For all of them and for all those who have given their lives al Kiddush Hashem for the sanctification of God's holy name, and for all those who have no one to say Kaddish for them, we join together on page 294, Kaddish Yatom, our mourners Kaddish. Yitkadal, Yitkadash, Shemerabba, Bialma, Divrach, Yerte, Bialmlich, Malchute, Bechayechon, of Yomechon, of Chayet, of Chol Beit Yisrael, Bagalau, Bizman, Kari, Vimru, Amen. יהי שמי רבה מבורך לעולם עולמי עולמיה, יתברך וישתבח ויתאר ויתרומם ויתנשא, ויתהדר ויתעלה ויתהלל שמי דקודשה בריחו, לילה מן כל ברכתה ושירתה, תושבחתה ונחמתה, דאמירם בעלמה ואמרו אמן. יהי שלמה רבה מן שמיה. וחיים עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום במרומיו, הוא יעשה שלום. עלינו ועל כל ישראל, ואמרו אמן. May the source of peace send peace to all who mourn, and comfort to all who are bereaved, and let us say together, Amen. Mitch and Kathy, Mazel Tov, today is your anniversary. No, last, never mind. The sixth was, oh, last Friday was. But uh, thank you so much for uh, honoring uh, us and uh, with uh, the Oneg tonight. So if you guys will come forward and come join Dylan. And Dylan, I think your mom is also celebrating a very special day. Tomorrow, her birthday. Lori, you have a birthday or had a birthday just recently. Come on over here. Here, we'll, we'll, we'll all come down here. Susan and Steve. Come on out. I don't know where Cheryl is. That's your first wife. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> come on up. 18 years. Um, <laughs> I am so, oh my gosh. I, I, I'm just going to have it like, you know, emblazoned on me somewhere. Uh, right, exactly. <laughs> Another, any other birthdays that I am missing for this? Mm -hmm. Come here, Jackie. Come here, Donna. Come here, Alyssa. 
All right. What? what who, are we, who are you pointing to? Where? Who? Huh? Come here. <laughs> Come on down. Excellent. Larry, did you serve in the Marines? Well, then please come on down and represent the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Hoo <laughs> There you go. All right. Okay, let's see. Um, so, you two get back over here. No, you, you're November 2? Never mind. Okay, fine. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. All right, here we go. <gasps> Hi, wait. Who's, who's coming over here? Hi. All right, so, Dylan, go ahead. Put your hands on the collar. All right, couple of you, put your hand on a collar. Find a piece. Find a piece. If you're not touching, come on, come on. There we go. Come here, Lori and Mitch. There you go, and Kathy. All right, if you're not touching the collar, touch somebody who is. There you go. All right, perfect. Okay, here we go. You ready, guys? Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, hamotzi lechem min haaretz b'tei avot. Go ahead, take a piece off and take it back with you. Take it back with you. Except for Darren, you're not allowed to take a piece yet because I got to do my, my usual shtick, you know. Yes, please, because you're like, I have to do this. Here you go, take a piece. So, because Darren, our blessings, you're gluten free. So, Alyssa, our blessings come not only from God's hand, but also not only from our hands, but God on high. There you go. <laughs> Mazel tov. There you go. Thank you so much for hosting Oneg tonight. All right, you're good. So, the entire family is November birthdays? Except for Dylan. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Well, while we are all standing, we're joined together with our closing song. I want to thank once again, Joyce, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And once again, thank you for sharing just an amazing story. And I, I love your presentation. Oh, my gosh. So we are going to join together with our closing song. You can find it in your prayer books if you like. America the Beautiful, page 377. Are we doing all the verses, Cantor? The top two, top of the, each column. Okay, the top of each column. <laughs> oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesties among the fruited plain. Shed his grace on me and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife who more than self their and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy glory find. Till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. Shabbat Shalom, everyone.